Hello, folks. Uh, I hope uh, that you had a good end of quarter. Uh, this is uh, one of those where at the beginning of the day today, I put out a short little video of a kid banging on a door of a, an animal pen, and all of a sudden the bull comes running out and <laughs> knocks him over. I said, okay, John, who's going to be, who's it going to be today? Is it going to be the bulls that come raging out into the uh, final day, the print of the quarter? Or is it the Bears? And I said, well, no, in eight and a half hours. And indeed, we know. <laughs> but now it was the Bears. Uh, we dropped 400 more or less into that final hour and a half or so. But folks, um, it's not just about that. Uh, I am delighted to have a friend of mine uh, who's going to be joining us and talking about what's going on uh, in Y charts land. Because these guys have some of the coolest software for charting. And it's if you've been seeing my live streams, you've seen me use their charts a bunch. And I just love this stuff. And they've added all kinds of new functionality to it. So with that said, let me welcome my friend Sean from Y Charts. Uh, he happens to be president and CEO. Sean, is that it? I'm head coach. Yes, sir. Head coach over at Y Charts. Well, Sean, it's great to have you. Turns out, folks, we're both in the Chicagoland area. Sean's up in the northern burbs, and I'm uh, here in Lincoln Park. And uh, let's let's do a little back and forth, Sean, and show them some cool stuff. Yeah. I think you guys are going to love the functionality of wide charts because, A, it's fast. B, it lets you compare so many different ways. It lets you take a look and see, um, you know, just the price movements on the charts, and Sean will be able to show you guys a lot more sophisticated stuff than I usually show. I usually just show them line charts uh, on, of, you know, what's going on for the past day, five days, mm -hmm. one month, or whatever. But it also does, folks, it'll take it into um, percent terms, how much has it moved in percent terms, and so forth. Mm -hmm. It'll let you plot one thing against another. It's pretty cool stuff. So, with that said, let me let Sean talked just for a little bit about how long Y Charts has been around and uh, all this new functionality that we're seeing every day on Y Charts, Sean. Yeah, um, we have been around. John, thank you for having me. This is awesome. Sure. Um, and and you are now visiting. Uh, you know, business as usual. Y Charts has turned into business as unusual. Y Charts, and you. I, I'm talking to you from, I guess, global headquarters up in the northern suburbs, but. <laughs> 12 business days ago, we went 100% virtual and it has been just an amazing um, time uh, for all of us and, and to take a company completely virtually and see that literally every statistics that, that we track um, has, has only improved dramatically. So it's been very neat. But uh, White Chart's been around 10 years. Our purpose for being is um, we want to make it easy to develop great insights on the market. So specifically, we make the complex easy and the easy quick, and we hope we're helping people uh, preserve and grow their nest egg. Well, I know there's pretty cool stuff um, every day. Um, if you don't mind, Sean, before we get into some of the really uh, uh, new, new stuff that you guys have, at least that I've been made aware of, if you wouldn't mind showing um, uh, those 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 two uh, industrial stocks, Caterpillar and uh, John Deere, because I wanted to tell folks just a little bit about these two, because we got to touch on it on uh, halftime report with uh, Stephen Tusa uh, was talking about what he has seen, Sean, as far and what his projections are for uh, the industrial stocks coming out of uh, the Corona slowdown shutdown. Uh, and then the subsequent stimulus that's being thrown at the market to try to either stabilize it or keep people from laying people off. Yeah. Are you seeing my screen here, John? Um, not yet. Okay. Does he have those controls, Laura? I think. There he goes. Does. There we go. Okay. So you should be seeing my screen now. And uh, I am for sure. So let's talk about this, right? This is a this is a really interesting picture that's showing uh, the these industrials uh, on the rise as a sector, as well as you know the specifics of deer and caterpillar. So, what what uh, what's your premise here? Well, um, 
this was pretty cool stuff, Sean. I mean, what Sean's going to show you guys is cool. Um, and what these friends of mine um, at CAMGIAN, which is C-A-M-G-I-A-N. That's a, if you guys check out that site, I'll have them on soon. But they basically, Sean, it's almost like a Mission Impossible movie or any of the modern uh, spy thrillers. You know how they go into a city and from some remote location, they start uh, using all of the uh, available um, cams that are up on buildings or people's cell phones as they're walking around, you know, with their cell phone mm -hmm. and they're sitting there, all of a sudden somebody sees something behind them, you know, because yeah. if, and we all know that that's a little beyond where we are right now, but there's a lot of this being applied right now, folks, as far as surveillance cameras and so forth. These guys in particular shot me some great alternative data, Sean, about um, the trucks that are coming in and out of Caterpillar, mm -hmm. Agco, and John Deere. They did it for a whole bunch of others, but I focused on those three uh, because of the type of manufacturing they do for farming and for um, uh, construction. Mm -hmm. And the, these guys are uh, deemed uh, uh, extremely important to the economy because of their uh, supplies to farmers, which we have to keep supplied, mm -hmm. as well as um, on the construction side, because the president today was talking about a $2 trillion stimulus package for infrastructure. So anyway, with all that said, Sean, what these guys can do is they can take hundreds and thousands of those surveillance cam videos, use a combination of machine learning and artificial intelligence, as well as human intelligence, uh, all of those cameras then, they, they take a look at everything moving in and out of those three manufacturers I talked about, mm -hmm. Caterpillar, John Deere, Agco. Mm -hmm. And Agco is like International Harvester and all that. Mm -hmm. The reason I didn't focus on them as much, Sean, is mm -hmm. that they only make about 20% of their tractors here uh, at Agco. That, that, so this is not a, I'm prejudiced against them because they're uh, manufacturing outside of our country. It's, mm -hmm. well, if only 20% of their stuff is manufactured here, it could skew my results yeah. um, too much. Yeah. So instead I focused on the other two. Now they do a rolling 30 day look at this data and this alternative data telling them, okay, here's how many trucks were coming out with, you know, front end loaders, with tractors, with, graders, you know, road graders or whatever it might be out of Moline, Illinois or out of um, Decatur. Uh, I mean, these guys were doing a lot of great work. And then before they actually flip it around and send it out uh, to all kinds of different agencies, they uh, use a little human intelligence and say, okay, here's how the machine has to learn uh, that this is important and this is. So with all that said, they showed that Caterpillar was a little slow in the beginning of February to react. Um, they were still ramping up production um, even as Corona was hitting harder and harder. Um, and then they went all the way negative and they went negative big. They went from a positive approximately 260% of production versus the prior, the rolling 30 days, they went to a negative 83% based on what was coming out of the plants. So that was pretty negative. And now they've just started, Sean, to start tweaking to the upside. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when I bought the stock then. Mm -hmm. um, because I said, if they're telling us that maybe they've bottomed as far as production, those mm -hmm. two stocks could be a buy. The other one, John Deere, they reacted quicker. Mm -hmm. um, they started closing or, or uh, slowing production, if not shuttering it, of course, because as I said, they're strategically important. So unless they have an outbreak, they're going to stay open. Um, yep. But the as they were doing that, um, they started coming out of this faster and started ramping up production. So I bought both of them. I bought calls in... Um, uh, Let's see, in Caterpillar, I think it was at the 
In one of them, it was at the 112 strike. I think that was Caterpillar. And in John Deere, I think it was the 140s or something like that. But anyway, I've turned them into spreads as it started to rally here. Um, and as you can see from, from that low point, you know, that's well through when uh, we see those significant turnarounds, Sean. Yeah. So I just thought it might be interesting for people to be able to see it, especially as you can display it at Y-Charts. Yeah, and I don't know if you were following while you were talking, I was changing the time horizon and I also put in the lows. You know, this is, it's fascinating looking at all kinds of different sectors and securities to see, you know, the tremendous drop and the pace of it, but also the the uptick. And, you know, obviously here what we're seeing is both Caterpillar and Deer uh, hit a pretty massive uh, drop in the last three months off of their uh, off of their highs. But boy, in the last couple of weeks, it's uh, it's been a nice uptrend. And, you know, let's let's see, you know, again, as we're seeing here one month, it's a very, very different looking picture. And, you know, you shorten it to two weeks. It's a uh, it's an even even um, even better looking picture for these securities. And I'm learning right along with you guys as far as how he does this. When I, this means, Sean, that when I'm putting out my charts in the future, I'll be able to put out cooler charts as well. <laughs> yeah, a lot of, a lot of hidden features that uh, we want to want to make uh, easier for you to self-discover, but, you know, here to, here to help you see how to do it. Um, the other one, Sean, if you wouldn't mind, before we get into some of the really cool new stuff um, from here is uh, um, those LQD because again, I'm gonna tie this back to halftime today too. Um, LQD folks is this um, bond and take a look at that versus the HYG, which is the high yield mm -hmm. bond and look at uh, both the severe fall offs and how they sort of track each other. But look when the um, better credit, if you will, when the investment grade bonds started uh, recovering, hitting their bottom just a few days earlier than the HYG, the high yield. And I think some of this, Sean, is because of what was going on with uh, the Fed when they basically said, well, you know, Q infinity and beyond, we're going to be able to buy whatever and have mm. up to $4 trillion <laughs> yeah. um, in, yeah. in liquidity to basically go out and shore up whatever we want um, yeah. because they made it unlimited. Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the broader theme of a kind of a flight to quality, right? And, uh, and um, you know, this is, a, this is a dangerous time to be in, um, you know, high risk anything. Certainly there's upside, um, high risk, high return. But yeah, as you can see, the... Uh, the investment grade bonds certainly uh, dropped less, you know, dropped 18% versus the 22% and then have uh, done a quicker and higher lift. Yeah. And um, like you say, and we were looking at, it kicked in just a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, folks, it could be some of the buying that the Fed was doing. Um, I'm not saying that they're buying these ETFs, although they could, mm -hmm. um, but if you're buying uh, bonds of the constituent companies mm -hmm. of these ETFs, um, that's one of the ways that you could see that kind of reaction. And high yields still have a long way to go to catch up. I mean, you know, you look at that chart and you look at the difference between the, uh, you know, the, the, the LQD, which is mm -hmm. the investment grades, and the high yields, they, they track each other to a certain degree, and you see them rebounding together and so forth. But look at how wide that spread is right now, how disparate, if you will. Mm -hmm. It's a full nine points almost from the HYG where it closed out today versus the uh, um, high yield um, versus the investment grades. So I think that's something uh, to sort of keep your eye on because if we start seeing a compression, Sean, mm -hmm. of those lines coming back towards each other, which yep. they were very close just, you know, 10 days ago or whatever that, right when it put in the low, Sean, yep. 
um, yeah. the, the, the investment grade. Yeah. It looks like at that time, you know, that they were virtually overlapping. Yeah. I mean, and now look, they look, pushed look at this. out to this. John, look at this. I just it lengthened the horizon to three months, right? And look at how small and, and in fact, inverted the spread is. Um, you know, let's lengthen it a little bit to the six month. I mean, these things have been so, so tight together. And then, you know, again, let's narrow ourselves down to where we are now. That spread is, is pretty large. Yep. I, I think that that can be a good tell. Yep. And by the way, folks, um, you may have seen that uh, us talking about, for instance, I think it was Sean Yum Brands. Yum Brands, uh, in December, they did an issuance because they were, you know, raising some money and they uh, did a bond offering. And I think it was under 4%. I want to say 375 mm. was the yield on that paper. And they're saying now it's over seven, it's almost eight. Um, and that's Yum Brands, obviously. Mm. Not exactly, uh, you know, some some garbage company. That's a pretty damn big. Um, and there's Yum China, as you guys know, YUMC, and then there's just YUM, mm -hmm. uh, Yum Brands, and that is uh, uh, a huge premium jump that they're having to pay for their new finance. Yep. Um, let's maybe uh, take them into Sean some of the cool new stuff because one of the reasons I reached out to Sean folks to uh, join me today was that he kept pinging me mercilessly um, with emails saying, Hey John, have you seen this? Have you seen this? And it was all really cool stuff about COVID-19, mm -hmm. which of course, you know, uh, the coronavirus and some of the various ways, sorry about that, uh, that they've shown us to, uh, uh, express yeah. what's going on in there. So if yeah. you wouldn't mind, Sean, let's show them through that. John, I, I love the fact that we're all getting used to this new world where business and personal life intermingle, like your, 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 uh, your voicemail, you know what, we're, we're all human now. And, and I was on a board related. That's a crazy voicemail, isn't it? I was on a board related call the other day and I'll be damned if my dog doesn't start barking because the, um, uh, the trash guys were driving by and, and my kids are saying, tell the dog to be quiet because, you know, it's interrupting my e-learning. And I'm like, well, I'm on a board call, guys. Can everybody just tone it down a little bit? But yeah, let's, um, John, you want to you wanna take a look, uh, you want to start with some macro stuff or do you want to take a look at the uh, coronavirus stuff? What would you like to take a look at first? Uh, well, you tell me, Sean, you, show, you tell me what the best way to Go through some well, of the cool well, stuff. I thought, out I thought maybe we can we can narrow down. Maybe we'll talk, take a look at the some a few things about the S and P five hundred. Um, All right. So, like, let's take a look real quick. And I pre did some of these charts because just to save us time and not not have me enter in titles and all this stuff on the fly. But like, look at the S and P five hundred. Um, percent change and then the the purple line is S and P five hundred and the orange line is uh, the VIX. So. Like we're obviously seeing huge dip in the S and P 500 in relation to past performance, and obviously seeing you know a heyday for volatility. We haven't seen volatility like this um, in a long time. But I, I I do think people lose a little bit of perspective on the volatility um, when when you look at the S and P 500 over a longer time horizon. Like look at this. This is the S&P 500, the dip we had to 23.67%, which is where it is now down into the 30s. But let's back up a few years because so many people have this really short time horizon are saying, wow, woe is me, woe is my nest egg. Um, do we remember 2008? Look at, look at how low we dropped in 2008, almost 57%. Um, back up to, you know, the, the late 90s, 2000s. And you can keep packing up past that. This is, you know, the, the 1987s. This has a, been a bad drop, but uh, widen your range a little bit and this stuff happens and, and we're in it right now. And you and I have been around the block a few times, John. I, I guess I'd, I'd probably speak for you. Um, yeah, this isn't a pleasant drop, but, you know, this also isn't new stuff for any of us, right? Right. Very true. 
the other thing I wanted to show you with, with the S&P 500 though is the drop that we saw, I think it was uh, March 16th here, that was the worst single drop that we've seen, right? I, I'm keeping the same time horizon saying the greatest jump was in the, um, in the 2008, 2009 timeline, jumped up 14 and percent and we dropped almost 11% on March the 16th. So neat, interesting things that, uh, that help us understand a little bit more about just how volatile things are. And um, you know, the, you know the, the other thing I'd probably wanna show you is this chart is showing us the, the VIX and the uh, unemployment jobless claims, right? Um, the the uh, unemployment claims jumped absolutely dramatically, usually steady state on a, uh, when announcements is a couple hundred thousand. Unemployment claims jumped up to 3.3 million claims. Um, you know, in, in the last reporting. So these are some really, really massive single spikes that, but if you just hone in on those couple days, you're, you're terrified. But again, if you extend your time horizon, I, I think it comes back into a little bit of perspective. Yeah, and we're gonna have a big one Thursday with the uh, uh, jobless claims again, because mm -hmm. that comes every Thursday, folks, unless it falls on a holiday. Yep. Um, every Thursday we get that jobless claims number. Yep. And we think about at this point in time, right? There's a lot of the, the trickle down that we would expect to happen. You know, um, employers whose businesses may have been impaired maybe for a couple weeks said, well, I, you know, I have a, a real commitment to my employees and I'm going to keep you know, supporting them. Um, but for some, there comes a point in time where they say, no, you know, I, I can't maintain this workforce any longer because you know the the livelihood of my business is important too and so yeah i i, I wouldn't expect to see uh, any any uh, big smiles coming out of uh, the the next release um let's see how well about, that one looked interesting that you just rode by the most affected economies by the coronavirus yeah right there yeah so this one is is a bit baffling to me. So let, let's look at this. This is showing the drop in uh, various countries. And, and one I want to point out to you, so you, you obviously see at the, at the lowest end of the spectrum is Brazil. The one that is most peculiar to me is this, you know, I'm not great with what colors, but you see, the, what is this? Um, light purple or whatever you call it. I'd have to ask my, uh, my kids what color that is, but negative 13% for China. Help me understand that. Help me understand how China, which was the epicenter of everything and um, the most impacted early on, they're, they're, it dropped by 13%, whereas you're seeing all of these other economies who have dropped significantly more. Any insights there, John, well, as to why, uh, why that would be? Two possibilities, uh, at least two possibilities, Sean. One, that uh, they're lying, yeah. <laughs> yeah. which a lot of us think that the information out of China is not very accurate yeah. ever, uh, that their GDP is overstated, that, you know, so many different, I, like I said, I love alt data, mm -hmm. and I love the way, you know, for years, one of the bits of alt data folks had been electricity use. They tried to figure out, okay, if China's really growing at six and a half or 7% GDP, then they must have X amount of consumption of electricity in order to produce yep. what they're producing to sell and so forth. Well, um, that is one bit of alt data, but of course you can leave uh, uh, lights on if you will, you can even leave machines running in some cases. But um, I, I think that there's a lot of doubt about the numbers that we get out of China. I think the other is that they've probably spent a lot more time manipulating their market yep. um, than we have mani manipulating ours. I'm yeah, not saying we don't. I mean, clearly right now, um, the Fed is manipulating the market. Um, and they're more or less trying to do it to our benefit Perhaps China thinks the same thing 
on their end, Sean, mm -hmm. but they're, they're trying to manipulate the market here by uh, putting these outside forces to keep um, big companies like American and United from laying off more than 25% of their workforce or whatever you have to do to qualify for certain loans and all that. Some of that is small business or SMEs, uh, small and medium enterprises. Mm -hmm. um, and some of that is for the biggest ones, like I have mentioned American or United, that are gonna be going for $12 billion bailouts and things like that. So yep. we're not gonna be able to use it to buy back shares. Yep. Share buybacks have been a big thing over the past decade, Sean, to keep us at high levels. Um, we'll see whether or not if you eliminate a lot of those share buybacks, um, exactly how robust the yeah. market is. I think we can bottom, um, but we might not see that much of a V. It might be more of a leaned over, you know, and moving this way rather than a V like yeah. that. Yeah, John, while you were talking, I just created, you know, there, there was a, you mentioned some things about uh, China statistics and maybe the accuracy. I, I'm, I like most are really skeptical of China statistics. I just quickly showed the China coronavirus cases versus the other three most impacted countries, the US, Italy, and Spain. Um, unfortunately, the US is the orange bar, which is, is not a great one. But as you can see, supposedly our cases have almost doubled the Chinese cases, which have completely flatlined. So, um, I'm highly skeptical that yeah, we, we've too. received transparency from China on all this. But you also mentioned something that that um, is an interesting one for me. You know, let's let's take a look real quick at um, at Boeing. Okay. So, man, talk about a company that's faced the perfect storm um, between their their um, faulty aircraft, whatever the the 747 Max. Um, and, and now, you know, you face all of the other issues that are going on with the market in general, and then specific to airlines, right? So Boeing has dropped, had dropped all the way to 76% off of its high. And this chart is a, um, uh, percent off high chart. And I don't see, know if you can see here, but you know, I can put the percent, I can put the original price percent off high, or what's the growth of 10,000. The interesting thing here is I think um, a lot of investors are deciding what kind of bets they care to place on the long term for Boeing, right? Like, do any of us think that a mon monopolistic U.S.-based airplane manufacturer is going to fail? You know, could is that in our national best interest or national security for an airline like this to fail? And I think there are a lot of investors on both sides of the is this a huge investment opportunity for me right now that'll pay off over a 12 to 24 to 36 month horizon? Or is this yet to bottom out? I guess I'd be interested in your perspective. What, do you, what are you thinking at the gut level about Boeing? Well, um, we were lucky enough, Sean, that um, uh, there were some really good tells in the options of Boeing. And they, when it was trading through 110, traded to 100, traded to 98, they were coming in and they were buying calls, mm. side calls at the 130 strike. And <clears throat> as we like to say a lot, there's uh, so much information embedded in an option trade, especially since we're talking big option trades, you know, mm -hmm. somebody, Sean, buying 5,000 contracts, yeah. uh, 10,000 contracts, that kind of stuff. I believe they bought two 5,000 lots up at the 130 strike in Boeing when it was just beneath 100. Um, and I think, I can't remember if those were August or April. I believe they were, um, or they might have been May. Mm -hmm. But in any case, um, you have, of course, the option gives you the right to buy it at the strike price that you own. Mm -hmm. So if they bought the 130 strike, they have the right to take it from you at 130. So strike price out of the money by a lot, you know, 30% out of the money strike price and they're buying huge numbers. Um, time frame is also embedded in that data. Um, the leverage that they're getting because instead of, for instance, um, you know, uh, a million shares of Boeing when it's a hundred dollar stock is a hundred million dollars. We can all do that. Mm -hmm. um, if you buy on the other hand 
an option for three dollars and you buy ten thousand of them you control a million shares of stock from 130 to wherever it goes and what they did sean was those calls went 50 some odd dollars in the money mm. um in just days on this bailout so they went from that level like yeah. i say with the stock at 98 um to all of a sudden the stock jumped into the 180s making those 130s the right to take it from somebody yeah. at 130 worth at least fifty dollars um huge trade huge trade and that's worth paying attention to and in the case of boeing um i agree with you the duopoly you know there's airbus and boeing then there's a couple regional jet makers like bombardier mm -hmm. um but there aren't a lot of uh there's not much competition in the big jet and transatlantic and all the rest, trans-Pacific mm -hmm. sorts of jets. And uh, they're also involved in defense, just like Airbus is. So yeah. I don't think either side, the European side or American side can afford to have yeah. their guy go out of business. Yeah, you know, and it'll be interesting what the collective mindset is on things like isolationism going forward, right? Because there, there's whole schools of thought that says, that, you know, when we, all as a, as a globe get out of this situation. Maybe there are some domestic policies and some openness to trade and you know what's really important to us is going forward, it, vitally important for us to produce 10 million um, masks for healthcare workers. Um, what are the things that we must own? I, I find it hard to believe that we would ever say we don't own not, Airbus notwithstanding that we don't need a successful manufacturer of aircrafts, but boy, the heyday that you were talking about for trading, look at the volatility on Boeing in the last uh, few weeks. It's uh, it hit a in one day high of 24.32% last week, but it had also hit almost a 24% low on another day. Like this is a fun time to be in the space that you're in, John, where you can play the option game and, 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 and have hedge yourself. And wow, has there seen some enormous volatility with this stock? Yeah, some enormous swings um, up and down. And I'm betting that that big swing that Sean was citing there, folks, just ahead of uh, that uh, news of the bailout where the stock just zoomed to the upside. Hello, Dexter. Um, yeah. Here's, by the way, here's stay there, Dexter. That's Dexter. <laughs> hey, Dexter, how are you? Yeah. So he loves, you know, yelling during my uh, broadcast. Does Dexter have a perspective on Boeing that he cares to share? Yeah, he, he doesn't want to get on a plane ever again, Dexter. <laughs> He's been on once, and that was enough for him. Yeah. Hey, um, I want to take a look at a at a couple other items. Um, so, if we look at uh, the Fang stocks, you know, again, I I'm just finding it so interesting, and and I'll be damned. My wife continues to call me up to bed and say, come on, you, you know, you got to call the work they done. I'm like, there's just so many fascinating things going on in the market right now. So, you know, the fangs, everybody's always been fascinated with the fangs. And if you take a look at the, the fang performance, I think one of the things you'll notice is um, Facebook actually, as of yesterday, was behind the S&P 500 return since um, January. It's now marginally moved above it. But I think you see even in this basket of precious, um, you know, tech related securities, you're seeing that the, the Netflix is, you know, obviously I'm, I've, I've discovered Netflix myself over the last week or two. Um, but, you know, you're seeing Amazon's at the absolute boom for their business side of things. Um, you're seeing others that are slightly outperforming the market. And then you're seeing Facebook, they, you know, social media is not necessarily um, of the same value to America at this point in time or on a go forward basis as some of these other tech companies are. Yeah. Have you, have well, you discovered, have you discovered any Netflix series while you've been off? Um, I still own some face. Uh, um, I can't remember if it was Netflix or, um, or if it was Amazon, but one of them has this crazy thing, Sean, I couldn't even watch it past the second episode. Um, it's, I think, a seven or eight part series called The Tiger King. Oh, John. 
it, oh my god i can't i can't do it my my wife made me watch i i'm i'm not much of a tv viewer last night i watched my first episode of tiger kings and it, it was a, like a train wreck and oh yeah but i i got done with that and i'm like what time do I really need to go to bed? Should I stay up and watch another one of these just odd human oddity shows? But yeah, it's hilarious. Oh my God. It makes Anna Nicole <laughs> Smith shows uh, back in the day look like, oh, she was completely normal compared yeah. to this guy. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> um, maybe we'll take a look at a couple, a couple other ones. Um, energy is, is an interesting one. Um, you know, the energy, you know, boy, what a, almost like Boeing, what a, what a challenging time in the energy and especially the oil, uh, oil and gas sectors between the OPEC and OPEC plus um, uh, price war that's taking place. And then guess what? None of us are driving cars. None of us are flying planes and none of us are doing the things that would be using their primary source of income. So if you look at, um, you know, XLE here, which is uh, the energy sector, you're going to see this negative 51% uh, return since January, just hammered. And who knows, you know, what, whether you're valuing things on a discounted cash flow or you're a, a technical trader or whatever, I don't know the good leading indicator to know when the um, the energy sector is going to pick things back up. And I don't know which influence, whether OPEC, the OPEC uh, trade or uh, price wars, or the fact that our economy is just not using fossil fuels right now, which one is the, uh, is the most important factor. Right. And um, last week, Sean, um, I had on uh, Larry McDonald on mm -hmm. Friday, um, really smart guy. Um, and Larry was talking about the credit default swaps of uh, BP, the five-year credit default swaps of BP, as well as of Saudi Arabia, uh, because they have five-year credit default swaps on Saudi. And both of them had spiked so significantly that we were both thinking something had to happen this week um, based on what he showed me. Um, and I, today, of course, we had a 7% pop in crude that we gave up throughout the day until it went to almost none. Let me see where it ended up um, as far as crude today. But uh, it, was, it was in a rough spot going into that. But they're running out of storage. Um, and when you run out of storage, uh, let's see, crude finished higher by 13 cents at 2022 something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, these guys that Russia, of course, the OPEC plus member and OPEC itself, um, although this was not unilateral, I mean, this was just MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, you know, mm -hmm. the leader of Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. that basically just said, screw Putin, I'm going for it. Mm -hmm. If he's not going to fall in line with us, I'll let him know what it feels like to hurt. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's literally like mutually assured destruction, Sean. Yeah. You know, they both put the guns to each other's heads. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, ultimately, oh. we will be some of the beneficiaries for a yep. while. But uh, right now, they're just pumping out crude oil with the virtually ran out of floatable storage or land-based storage. Yeah. Um, there's nowhere to put it. Yeah, this is this is incredible. While you were while you were talking, I pulled up the WI, WTI versus Brent crude, and you know it's it's incredible, and it and it also ties into. Well, we should take a look. I, I pulled something up for the top five um, performing stocks. Let's see, top five stocks since the top. So S and P five hundred. What are the top five performing stocks? Um, interest. So S and P five hundred down twenty three point three eight percent. Um, you know, Cabot Oil is an interesting one, right? This is a natural gas company. So, you know, the, the bet is, um, you know, uh, on while these, these battles are going on, maybe there is a turn towards natural gas. And then not surprising to any of us, I, I thought it was kind of humorous in a sad way. Other highest performing stocks, Clorox, right? All of their products for, for helping us, um, 
keep surfaces uh, clean and, and, and bacteria or, or, or virus free. Um, Citrix, I assume to be associated with all the working from home and everybody yep. who needs to, everybody who needs to port their application to be a working from home or how you can access it with security. And then, you know, pharmaceuticals companies that are either involved with um, uh, testing and test like things or uh, supplying uh, the medical field, you know, since the big dip, these are the, these are the five stocks that have per, uh, performed the best. Yeah. Amazing. And, uh, well-deserved. Um, I'm sure Netflix isn't too far, uh, behind in there because, uh, boy, Netflix, uh, that you mentioned just a moment ago has just been such an animal in, uh, in the face of all this, you know, there you have it. Yes. Yeah, so let's, let, let's, let's check a couple more out. Let's just pull, um, by the way, and then, you know, you've seen the, the humorous thing about, so zoom video is, this is, um, you know, obviously the application that is, uh, a lot of American businesses are using right now. Netflix really has, uh, over the last couple weeks, um, started to make a nice, uh, actually uh, the last week started to make a, a nice jump. I, I don't know if, if you've seen, um, I find Oh yeah. This, the Chinese company zoom. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to get, I'm going to get rid of a lot of the stocks I had up here and just show you, um, the two zooms, right? This other zoom, which I think investors are getting mixed up in, which is, um, you know, zoom technologies is, jumped 245% over the last, let's see, the last month. Now, 54% over the last month had a huge jump. Investors got mixed up. Assume the ticker was Z-O-O-M. People jumped in. Um, it's a nice mistake to have made. I, I reflect on that. Somebody made that mistake. They had a, they far exceeded the return they were likely due if they had bought the right company. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we should all have uh, such good fortune on our mistakes. Um, Maybe if you could, Sean, I know that there is a, are a whole host of coronavirus related uh, um, charts that we can look mm -hmm. at um, that you guys have uh, added just recently. Yeah. At least I found them recently and you kept pinging me with, yeah. uh, John, you got to see this. Well, I, I, I think um, the coronavirus is having a tremendous impact on capital markets, right? So why the hell would um, uh, an investment research company put coronavirus statistics in? Because it's driving a massive um, uh, amount of volatility in the market. So we think it's important that people understand these statistics and are able to map these statistics and maybe the leading indicators of us all becoming healthier to the um, to indices and other things. So I'll just pull up on the coronavirus statistics. Um, Let's just look at New York. Um, I'm just picking a state. We can go state by state, but um, there's some things, a whole bunch of statistics we can take a look at here. Um, I try to stay away from the coronavirus deaths statistic, but people um, tend to want to understand that. I more spend my time on the leading indicators, which is cases, tests, and and, and things like this. And you know, it, it seems to me, and I am not, I don't work for the CDC or the WHO, but we dramatically need to increase our number of tests and um, our hospital beds, and, you know, and the capacity. And I'm seeing such amazing innovation in America right now that I, I'm, I'm awed. I, I hope it can go quicker, but I am awed by the innovation. Like I saw something out of uh, MIT that said, they have an open source way to, to develop a respirator for $100. Mm -hmm. I saw some New York hospitals who have taken respirators and found a way to split one respirator into two to save two lives rather than one if we're in the world of constraints. Um, you've seen these announcements about new test kits becoming available that don't take two days or a week to get a test. You know, you're seeing things like 45 minutes and 15 minutes. And, and the thing that's so hopeful and promising for me in America is that, you know, our brightest minds seem to rise to the occasion. Our best companies seem to rise to the occasion to solve these problems. And I guess the small role we play, because 
my staff isn't good at uh, at developing respirators, and, <laughs> and, and and we're not we're not good Nor at we. we're not good at saving lives, but we're pretty good at helping people see uh, what all this data is all about. And, and I tend to look at on a state by state basis and say, what do the leading indicators here look like? Um, it, could you pull up Abbott Labs, by the way, ABT? Yeah. Because Sean, um, ABT. The reason for this one, folks, of course, is over the weekend, uh, they said that they have this five-minute test and that they got the go-ahead from the uh, FDA to, on an emergency use basis, um, begin producing these in mass quantity. And when you see um, uh, this jump, which from the 23rd of March when it was 64 to, you know, it, it traded, I think, over 70, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, over 81 um, just recently on, on that big pop. Uh, yeah. And th the announcement, I think, Sean, was made Saturday when the markets were closed. Mm -hmm. But when you look at that, um, I think this they're capable of making 50,000 of these machines per day. Um, and then delivering them out to folks. There you see that, that you know, uh, some of the pops um, that, that you've seen out of this, out of Abbott. Johnson & Johnson has some positives too, but I think these were two reasons we had some of the optimism we had yesterday. Um, and I think today is, as I said at the top of the broadcast, just a question of who needed to even up um, the uh, uh, positions on the rebalance was it the bulls or the bears it seemed likely it would be the bears. And if so, um, we might see a nice opportunity tomorrow, but again, we're going to have to see um, exactly how much people are willing to uh, hold into what's going to be a pretty bad number on Thursday. Um, as long as the range is still that big, which it was last week, Sean, Mm -hmm. um, people were saying to me, I don't understand why the markets are reacting this way. And I said, because the range was 1 million to 5.5 million. It came in at 3.2. It didn't press the upper end of the range. As yeah. bad as it is, a new record as it is, you know, the old one was, I think, under 800,000. Um, coming in at 3.23 million. Um, that's still better than the worst case scenarios at Citigroup and some other uh, folks that put their numbers out there. Yeah. Yeah, you know, one of the, one of the things I, I like to, to take a look at is um, we, we've got these uh, model portfolios and, and pulling this up, um, you know, I, I've been trying to track John, and I'd just be interested in in maybe your your general impressions of the of the um, sectors that have been the hardest hit. I created a couple models, and let's pull a couple of those up. Let's pull up casinos. Let's pull up cruise lines. Let's pull up hotels. Um, and let's look at that over the last three months and let's go normalized. So cruise lines down 78%, um, hotels down and, and I should put airlines in here. And then let's, as a point of comparison, let's put the S&P 500 total return. All right, so under the three-month time horizon, down 19.36 is the general S&P 500. These sectors massively, um, you know, impacted. I guess I'd be interested in your perspective on what kind of things would a smart investor need to see to restore their faith that these stocks or the these sectors have the ability to return to you know, I guess revert to the mean at some point in time. Um, hotels down 44.53%, airlines down 52%, you 
we already talked about Boeing. Thoughts on what a smart investor needs to be looking for to say, I'm ready to buy the dip and wait for the upside? Sure. Um, I, I was talking to one of the largest hoteliers in the country about this, and they were telling me about various hotels and how much their bookings were down and how many cancellations they had. And at first I was shocked because I didn't understand the business well enough, apparently. But when they told me, for instance, Orlando, big uh, area for tourism, of course, Disney, Universal, SeaWorld, all that stuff. Um, when, when they said that they were already experiencing um, a loss of uh, close to 20% of the entire year. I said, how is that possible? As I was thinking about it. And they said, well, because everybody's canceling. So it's not just they're not just canceling if they had a room, for instance, in March and April. They're not just canceling those. They're canceling their June reservations. They're canceling their July reservations. They're canceling all the way out on the scale. So um, they said, we know that these people will come back. We don't know when. And that's why we're in so much trouble here. That's why we're in so much pain. Because, for instance, one of these hotels, one, uh, does about $50 million in rev per year, Sean. And they there's just one hotel, one single hotel. Um, and... Uh, they'd already had 20 million in cancellations mm. at that one hotel. Now, you guys can do the math. That's 40%. Um, and they're pretty sure that, you know, when people feel safe, they'll come back. Mm -hmm. But what it'll take is the same thing it'll take for us to go back to work. I mean, Sean and I are working from home right now. I got to believe 95 or 99% of you are working from home as mm -hmm. well because of shelter in place orders and things like that. That test, that Abbott test, or another test that can tell you if you've got the antibodies, meaning that you've got the resistance, you've already had it, mm -hmm. um, and you've got the resistance to it, it'll allow you to go back to work. Because even if there's an infected person that then came to work, hopefully that means that you couldn't get it again. Mm -hmm. um, but that kind of thing needs to happen, Sean, in mm -hmm. my mind, for people, for these uh, companies. And once you have a test that is a rapid test, that is not terribly invasive, mm -hmm. that whether it's a swab in your nose or whatever it might be, I think those kinds of things that could help people uh, gain some uh, um, comfort that they're not going to get sick or not going to get sick again, depending whether it's the test for the antibodies or just keeping sick people at home, however it happens to be. Mm -hmm. um, I think those kind of things will help a lot mm -hmm. getting the market back on its feet for these. But I'm not uh, mm -hmm. as bullish as I am mm -hmm. about America and about you know how we deal with crisis like this. I'm still thinking that that is, you know, we're lucky if that starts to percolate by May. But again, yesterday and the uh, Abbott Labs and Johnson and Johnson and Gilead and mm -hmm. all the uh, Moderna, all the companies that are trying to do something with this, Regeneron, mm -hmm. Novartis, I mean, all of these companies, folks, that are addressing this, uh, whether it's with testing, whether it's vaccine, whether it's um, treatment, whatever it might be, um, as well as what Sean mentions about um, being able to make a, a ventilator for $100 mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. All of that kind of stuff will mean that we peaked mm -hmm. and we're starting to roll over, uh, mm -hmm. which is, you know, once we hit that area, Sean, mm -hmm. this thing's going to be up like a rocket yeah. um, because people will go back to um, yeah. their old habits. The, the one I struggle with personally is the cruise lines. Mm -hmm. Because I, I will soon get back on planes. And I, I struggle soon, with those too. I don't want to get in a captive airflow. In my life. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, I, the only reason I would ever go on a cruise again, Sean, would be mm -hmm. if it were a real small cruise line like Crystal, mm -hmm. something like that. I've been on the biggest ones on earth. 
the ones with like mm -hmm. 4,800 or 5,400 uh, passengers mm -hmm. and then a crew of a thousand or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in going back. I wasn't interested when I did them. I wasn't interested. I only did it because my daughters wanted to do it. Yeah. Um, and I think once was enough for them too. So no, now, I, I don't I, think. I, th I, th I think the big question is what would somebody have to pay you to book a 2021 cruise for your family? And my wife and I had this discussion. We said there is no amount of money that would get us to book a 2021. And I feel awful for this industry, right? These are hardworking, good people who have their own mission and, and companies have their own charters. It's just that that one's going to be tough. I look at the airlines though and the hotels and, and to a lesser degree, the casinos and say, yeah, we will be traveling again and we will be gambling again and, and we will be staying in hotels again. Um, those seem like an interesting opportunity to me to, uh, yeah, I agree. Make a point I jump mean, in. If you it, just put the casinos up and take everything else, but the S and P total return down, please. <laughs> um, so take the cruise lines, hotel stocks, airlines. Um, Ricky Sandler made a nice call on our network. I think, um, two weeks ago, Sean, where he said, hey, look, um, you know, uh, the guy manages $7 billion. Mm -hmm. Five or six billion of that is in a hedge fund, traditional, you know, where he has longs and shorts. Mm -hmm. And then one of them, uh, I think he has one fund that is almost $2 billion that is uh, long only. But he said, John, people are going to rage back at casinos. You'll see. Mm -hmm. He said, if you want to bet against people going back to Vegas, he mm -hmm. said, you don't really understand what <laughs> Vegas is all about. And I said, I'm not the guy betting against you, Ricky. I think Ricky's right. Um, I know Josh, my friend Josh Brown, wasn't, he was laughing and thinking that Ricky, you know, didn't know what he was talking about. But I think that they will go back to uh, casinos. And I think that uh, significant dips could be bought. Um, and I think that you need to uh, be doing it with an option trade mm -hmm. instead of the stock. Yep. Yeah, it's a, that seems like a, a real opportunity there. Well, did you have any other uh, charts we need to show them, Sean, or are we pretty much, uh, we run the gambit? I think, I think we've run the gamut. I think the, um, I, I'm always open and, you know, if anybody uh, has interesting ideas that they want to see charted, if they don't have a charting package that works for them, I'm always happy to get, you know, uh, DM me at, uh, on Twitter or something. I love yeah, pop creating up your, uh, pop up the, one of those slides that had your, uh, um, your Twitter handle again, Sean yeah. underscore at Y charts. There it is there right it there. Is. So folks, if you want to ask Sean some questions, at Sean, S-E-A-N underscore Y charts is how you'd get a hold of them. Mm -hmm. you want to send them to me, you know my handle, mm -hmm. at John Najarian. And uh, we'll have to get Sean back on and we'll look at some more charts in the not too distant future. But uh, these guys do nice work over here at Y charts. I wanted to share that with all of you. Hey, John, thank you for having me on. And, and to you, and your family, and, and to all your listeners, I hope everybody's safe. Um, widen your, your charts and you'll see we, we've been through trauma before. We'll recover from this. But in the meantime, let's all bunker down and stay healthy and, and uh, enjoy the small moments. Exactly. Great advice. Thank you, Sean. Folks, you. Sean uh, from Y Charts, and I am John Najarian from Market Rebellion. We appreciate you guys joining us. This will repost shortly and uh, Sean will be able to send it out to his crew. We'll get a, uh, uh, a link to you, Sean, shortly. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great night.